Uh, kia ora everyone, I'm Caroline McElnay and I'm Director of Public Health and thank you all very much for coming today. We really value uh, the role that you're playing in, in helping us get some clear messaging out to our population at this time. Um, we haven't got a sign language interpreter with us today, so, um, but we will assure you that we'll have a written transcription of this footage as quickly as possible up on our website. I want to cover off um, the uh, uh, results from our TAG technical advisory group meeting, which was this morning, and um, give some information about a public health campaign that we're launching, personal protective equipment, and an update on numbers. So firstly, there are still no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in New Zealand. To date, around 125 tests have been carried out. They've all been returned negative. We are, as you'll be aware, always testing cases. And the, the uh, TAG meeting this morning was really around providing advice to our cl clinicians around who to test and when to have a suspicion for testing, and I'll, I'll move on to that next. We have about six tests that we're still waiting for results. So moving on to our case definition, our technical advisory group is meeting weekly at the moment to provide clinical advice and guidance to the ministry. As you know, the situation with COVID-19 is rapidly evolving around the world, and we've seen just this week increases in cases in the Republic of Korea, Italy, and Iran in particular. We have now 38 countries globally, including mainland China, who have one or more confirmed cases of COVID-19. So in the light of this, we asked our TAG group this morning um, how New Zealand should best respond to this changing situation. And at this morning's meeting, the TAG has advised that we um, use two categories for looking at countries, category one and category two. So category one countries includes anyone who has traveled from or via mainland China in the past 14 days. That's what our current advice is. And for category one, the advice would be that those people who've been traveling in those countries, in that country, which is mainland China, go into a period of self-isolation for 14 days. The other category, category two, relates to countries where we are seeing a higher level of cases uh, being reported in those countries and our advice to clinicians is to have that higher level of suspicion for people who present with symptoms who have been in those countries and those countries are Hong Kong, Iran, Italy, Japan, Republic of Korea, Singapore and Thailand. So that's very much for clinicians to guide their assessment of people with symptoms and the testing uh, of those individuals. We want to emphasize that anyone who has visited those countries in the previous 14 days who develops symptoms of fever, cough, or shortness of breath, we really want to emphasize that they should ring ahead by either phoning Healthline on the dedicated number, which is 0800 358 5453, or ring ahead to their normal GP practice. So just re-emphasizing, category two countries are different to category one countries. The only country in the category one is mainland China. Obviously that advice may change, countries may move between those categories, depending on the epidemiology and the number of cases that we see, and we will be constantly updating that. On a daily basis, we'll be updating which countries are in Category 1 and Category 2. If I move on to the public health campaign, from tomorrow, New Zealanders will start to hear and see a public health campaign focused on what they can do to protect themselves, their family, and whānau and our communities. This campaign will have a real focus on hand washing and drying our hands properly so that we can stop the spread of germs and viruses. Our health is in our hands and the campaign will provide simple straightforward tips on how we can all play our part. So look out for that from tomorrow. 
One of the other issues that I know um, um, we certainly are very aware of here at the Ministry uh, is the need for our frontline health professionals to get the support and equipment that they need to keep them safe. We have been checking through our DHBs and PHOs for gaps that there may be out there at a primary care level and um, we are ensuring that supplies of equipment that they need will get to those practices as soon as possible. Just a brief update on Whangaparoa. Um, our Whangaparoa Reception Centre has six New Zealanders there at the site. If you recall, these were the New Zealanders who we assisted to come back from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. They are all doing well. They're showing no signs of COVID-19, which is really great. They still have daily health checks. And finally, uh, quick update on the numbers. So in the last 14 days, we have had 2,640 travellers who've arrived into New Zealand from mainland China. And on Healthline, we currently have 2,191 who are currently reported as active and registered with Healthline. I think that's um, all that I um, want to update you on um, at the moment. Happy to take any questions. The supplies for the DHBs and things like that, exactly what is, I know we've talked about masks, but does that include gowns and um, aprons and things like that? Yes, it includes a, f a full set of what we call personal protective equipment. So that's masks, gowns, gloves, eyewear, and there's a... Um, there's a list. There's a, there's a list on our website of, of what that um, generally contains, and what we're seeking information through our DHBs and PHOs is what is the status of that equipment out there at a practice level. So we don't know right now if we have the right amount in our country. We have a we have we do have a lot of supply. I think what we want to make sure is that the supply is distributed across the country because we we really don't know where anyone at any moment uh, could present to primary care with uh, COVID-19 if they've been overseas. So we need to make sure that we've got that distribution across the country. And so that's our real focus at the moment, make sure that every practice has got supplies of PPE. Where have you found the gaps? You said there were gaps um, in some of the DHBs and I haven't got that information uh, to hand at the moment, but that is what we've, um, we've asked the DHBs and the PHOs to report on. That is currently being reviewed by our team in our health coordination centre, and then they will be working with those DHBs and PHOs to make sure that equipment gets out to those practices. So is it likely we could order in more gear from overseas if we're short? Yes, that, 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 that's part of the assessment. It's making sure what we've got in country is well distributed, but then also what else do we need to get in to New Zealand so that then we can keep that supply chain going. In terms of a pandemic plan, Australia have what I guess they're calling an emergency lockdown situation where schools and businesses would shut and rugby games or something might not go ahead. Do we have something planned for that if well, it happens? Well, we are starting that, that um, detailed planning around for a COVID-19 response. What could that look like? These are all scenarios, potential scenarios, and we already have our uh, influenza pandemic plan, which outlines a lot of those possible scenarios. So what we're, we're now doing is actually putting that in the context of what we know about COVID-19. And that's a very active piece of work that the ministry is now doing as a result of what we are seeing across the world, where we're certainly seeing spread in other countries. We're watching that really closely to see what happens. But we do have to be prepared in New Zealand for the possibility that that, that may happen uh, at some point in the future here so, in New Zealand. So if we get an outbreak in New Zealand, um, what would that mean uh, for our usually busy flu season? Uh, we're going to have yeah. the winter yes. coming. Yes, well, that's, that, will, that would be a challenge, and, and we acknowledge that as a, as a challenge. What we can do with flu season is make sure that as many people as possible get vaccinated with their, their flu vaccination, which will be starting in the beginning of April, and that at least will hopefully reduce the impact that we have from flu uh, when that arrives. But I think that's certainly something that, as, as part of our planning, we do need to look at how we could 
manage some potential scenarios around possible numbers if, if we had an outbreak. But that's all quite theoretical because we, we do not have any cases in New Zealand. If we did start to see cases, it's highly likely that they would just be single pop-up cases, as Australia has seen. And so our strategy there is to, to mind a very vigorous response to any any cases to make sure there was no spread from that single case. And Australia has shown how they were able to do that very well. They didn't get any spread from those cases. And that's what we would, that's our immediate plan for what would happen here and now. But obviously we need to start thinking about what a future scenario could look like and plan for that. Just going back to the start of your talk, the focus is still on China. Our cases there are slowing. So why at the moment is it not the right time to be putting restrictions in place for what people that have come from South Korea and Italy. So we're looking at the data very closely. The recommendation from our tag this morning is we're not yet at that position to, to, to make to give that advice, but it is very much dependent on the data and the amount of disease that we're seeing in countries. That's one of the reasons why we said we need to update this on a, a daily basis, because it is evolving quite rapidly uh, across the rest of the world. So um, we will be very dependent on the data for those decisions. And with the pandemic plan that's now three years old, um, I was just wondering if you could explain what it means in there where it says protect affected countries in terms of what affected islands, sorry, and also what that protection would look like. Okay. Um, the In terms of an impact of any disease on a country, it's not just the number of cases that you might get you are very dependent on the health system in that country and uh, our, our Pacific Island countries have have said themselves that their health system um, could be more adversely affected by an outbreak of COVID-19 just in terms of their ability to respond and contain and so we are having uh, frequent conversations with the Pacific Islands around how we in New Zealand can help support the islands. One of the main issues there is helping them to keep it out as long as possible. So is that where the protection is looking at this stage? So at this stage it's mainly around uh, helping to keep it, keep it out but also then provide advice about um, immediate containment measures if they did have a case and about supporting their healthcare practitioners to both, both in terms of um, personal protective equipment, but also then any clinical management of that case. That's where a challenge would be if they had people who were severely ill, which we know um, w could be a challenge for some of those countries to manage. Are you considering plans yet for New Zealand people to be going over via New Zealand staff and our DHBs to help if that is to Those would be part of potential scenarios. We're not currently looking at that. That's obviously not something that we need to do at the moment. All scenarios are being looked at and then what, so that's where the pandemic plan is really useful because it provides that overview of the sort of things you need to consider. Now that we know more about COVID-19, we can start applying some specifics to that and say, okay, this is what we've seen in other countries. This is what is likely to happen with this particular disease and then get just a bit more specific around our response. In terms of the vaccine, um, it's been said that we could have one by the end of April. Um, if that did happen, you know, hypothetically, how quickly could we roll that out here? I think it's highly unlikely we'll have one by the end of April. Okay, well, I guess if we do get one, what's the process by yeah. just getting across the same thing? I think... Um, it's, it's probably much more likely that we're, we're talking possibly up to 18 months before there would be a vaccine available. And for something, from what we know of this disease, it is, it is highly likely, I think, at this stage that you would then be seeking to use the vaccine to protect those who are most likely to be severely affected by this disease. So what we're seeing is about 80% of people who, who get COVID-19, it's a fairly mild disease and it's the 20% who are more severely affected. So we would be looking to target uh, those, that 20% because they're the ones who are more likely to become critically ill. Um, and uh, we know that there's a 2% death rate. So I think it would be about identifying key groups. So would that be like elderly immune? So it could be. I think, I think probably the most similar situation would be with influenza. 
and what we do with influenza vaccination. Influenza is very similar in that some people have a, a milder illness, but some people can get very badly affected and there are deaths that occur from influenza. So using the same sort of logic, we would then look at our vaccine being used to protect those who are most likely to become really ill from the disease. So the flu, flu jab is not going to protect you from, from this virus, no. but it, I guess if you've got the flu, you, you're probably more vulnerable then, isn't yeah. it? Well, we, what, we, what we see from um, overseas is people who have got underlying health conditions or other problems seem to be the ones who are more likely to, to be um, badly affected. So one of the things that we need to do everything we can to avoid disease as much as possible, and with, and with influenza, we have got a vaccine. So I think that's certainly a, a very key strategy that we want to enforce or roll, roll out this year with us getting close to having our normal flu vaccine season You've coming got, along. Sorry, you've got time for one All right, one more. Okay, so what, just going back to older people, um, in the 2017 pandemic plan, it doesn't appear that there is a plan for aged care or nursing homes in the event the virus spreads here. What's being looked at in that area? Well, those are very uh, key groups that we do have to look at. I think what we're seeing from this particular disease is it does seem to be affecting older people more. Every disease does tend to be a little bit different. Sometimes they affect younger people, sometimes they affect older people. So certainly in our planning we will have to look at um, how we would respond to an outbreak in an aged care facility, for example. So are you looking at that? Yeah, that will be part of the planning that we're, we're, we're ramping up now.